Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. If you want to drop your name in the chat, if you're on the webinar, please go ahead and do so. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization focused on protecting the Constitution and the separation of church and state for over a decade. We have some incredible programming, including our Friday updates from all kinds of amazing speakers. Um, and next week, like I said earlier, we're going to be speaking with R.L. Stoller. He's going to be talking about the rights, dangerous resurrection of malicious child predator myths. Um, I was not able to attend the Peoria Unified School Board meeting last night, but I heard that the rhetoric in that room was even worse than normal. And now two board members, I've heard, uh, were also quoting scripture at the board meeting. Um, anyway, so uh, this is very relevant to the things that we are talking about right now. Um, if you're interested in these kinds of programs, please consider becoming a recurring donor to support the work that we do at the legislature, at, at, the legislature, at school board meetings, and with our action alerts. Um, I, before I introduce our speaker today, I did want to mention that one of our most staunch supporters, Ellen Gittleman, passed away last week due to an accident with her horse. She was a passionate supporter of the separation of church and state and was involved in many political campaigns and advocacy groups throughout the years. So our condolences go to her family and she will be sorely missed. Um, but today we are speaking with Ari Drennan. Uh, they are the LGBTQ program director for Media Matters, uh, where she's worked since January of 2022. She has a bachelor's degree in political science and economics from Middlebury College. Previously, she worked at the Center for American Progress and the League of Conservation Voters. So welcome, Ari. I so appreciate you being able to clear things out and join us today. And I know that everybody here is really excited about our conversation. So with that, I'm going to let you do most of the talking. Uh, if questions come up, can I just throw them at you as they come up? Or would you want to wait till the end? Or how would you like it? That's a really good question. And thank you so much for having me. I figured um, a way that I think this would work best is kind of I have a, a story I'll tell. And then um, if there are questions, like hopefully there should be lots of time for that at the end. Does that work for you all? That, that sounds great. Okay, great. All right. Thanks again. Um, and thanks again for all your patience. Um, so it's always a hard, it's always hard to find a place to start the story. But I think that the 2004 election is as good a time as any. Um, George W. Bush had run for president in 2000 as a compassionate conservative. Um, but with 9-11, two wars raging and a recession by 2004, the compassionate part of the conservatism had gone well and truly out the window. So in the midst of what looked like a difficult re-election campaign, President Bush announced that he was supporting a constitutional amendment to ban gay marriage, which he said was necessary to protect the most fundamental element of civilization, the marriage between a man and a woman. His competitor, John Kerry, protested somewhat weakly at the time that this was a wedge issue meant to divide the American public but it was an extremely popular position at the time. And in the same statement, Kerry himself agreed that marriage should be between a man and a woman in his words, and that the issue of marriage should best be left to the states. In November of that year, George W. Bush won the presidential election and the popular vote by 3 million votes. And this 19 years ago was the last time that a Republican presidential candidate has received more votes than his opponent. Bush never got his constitutional amendment, thankfully, and indeed public support swung wildly in favor of gay marriage from 37% in 2005 to 60% by 2015. And 2015 is an important year because that is the year that the Supreme Court ruled that same-sex couples enjoyed the same right to marriage as anybody else. In just a 10-year period, the preferred cultural wedge issue of the Republican Party, the thing that had won them the popular vote, disappeared completely off the table. And so Donald Trump's candidacy represented a kind of initial attempt at grappling with the new battlefield, as it were, uh, a new attempt to create an electoral coalition around animus towards immigrants and elites that treated the inclusion of LGBTQ people as 
somewhat settled, something uh, to be rolled back around the edges, you know, policy changes under the Trump administration that would allow Christians to discriminate on LGBTQ people based on what they said were their beliefs, um, policy changes to ban transgender people from the media, but notably did not feature the same genre of all out public onslaught against the LGBTQ community. And I'm happy to talk more after um, about why that might have been. But what's important is that it didn't work. Um, Trump did not win the popular vote in 2016, and he didn't win the election in 2020. Um, and the degree to which suburban white women in particular fled his coalition caused a desperate scramble within the Republican Party to bring them back. And so after extensive focus group and poll testing, the right wing media landed on a really convenient villain, trans women in sports. Now, trans athletes have been eligible to compete up to the Olympic level since 2003 without much success. Um, for a number of reasons, again, that's something I'm willing to get more into if there's questions, trans athletes are very rare at every level, but they do exist. And so as long as they exist, trans athletes became a really, scape a really convenient scapegoat for the increasing complexity of the modern world, the abandonment of traditional beliefs, and the anxiety around that, and critically, the spiraling affordability crisis of higher education. It's one thing to watch your daughter lose out to somebody who you perceive as an undeserving competitor in an athletic event. It's quite another if you're being reminded that she might miss a chance at a scholarship. But again, trans athletes are quite rare. And while most voters actually don't support trans athletes competing on teams that align with their lived gender, they also can see that this is not a priority. So I've watched focus groups of voters where they're shown these, you know, horrible attack ads about how, um, you know, ex-politician wants biological men to defeat your daughter in sports. And voters laugh at that. They're like, this is not the problem in my life right now. And so, um, you know, especially with the Republican focus on rolling back access to abortion, it's really unlikely that voters are going to switch parties en masse over this issue, even if their positions don't necessarily align with mine. So as part of that in October 21, we started to see the rise of a new narrative online. And that narrative was that trans people are grooming your children into turning trans. It's not a particularly new narrative. It's, it's something that was actually quite popular going back to the 1970s. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about Anita Bryant's role in popularizing the idea that members of the LGBTQ children, uh, sorry, members of the LGBTQ community, the trolls are gonna have fun with that one, are looking to exploit and recruit your children, which is really, really not the case at all. Um, I didn't really, like kids when I was a kid, I have no desire to talk to anybody's children about being trans, but facts can't get in the way of a good story. And in March, that narrative was seized by viral Twitter harassment account Libs of TikTok, which then spread from there to Fox News, Joe Rogan's podcast, which has 11 million listeners, and the governor of Florida, whose staff adopted that very framing to justify a total ban on discussion of the existence of LGBTQ people in public schools. And so by the 2022 midterms, attacks on trans people have become inescapable, being the subject of campaign speeches, millions of dollars worth of ads in Arizona, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and beyond. Um, you know, one thing that you might have noticed was Carrie Lake attacking Katie Hobbs for her husband's, um, her husband's therapy practice where he had provided psychological support to a trans young person. Like even that was considered um, something that was fair ground for political attack, which I think is a really disgusting sign of how far this all got. Fortunately, that whole approach was incredibly unsuccessful. So while millions of dollars were poured into this issue, once again, trans people are very rare in society, and it's it's hard to convince people that like we are the existential threat in their lives right now. And so the 2022 midterms were generally a flop for Republicans, and Democrats 
beating expectations held on to control of the Senate. But unfortunately, Ron DeSantis' success in Florida, which was honestly more of a function of 400,000 new Republican voters moving there during the pandemic, has convinced the Republican Party that this is a wedge issue that has legs. And that's why it will continue to be a major factor moving into the 2024 campaign. So 2023, as you might know, has been the worst year in recent history for LGBTQ anti-LGBTQ legislation with over 475 proposed laws to restrict our rights, about 10% of which have now been signed into law, including bans on trans athletes in most red states and bans on gender affirming care for most trans for trans people under 18 in more than 15 states. This is an issue that's here to stay and I'm happy to get into any questions about where else it's coming from what any of the other, other motivations are here or the issue itself but this is what I want to start off with thank you okay uh, we don't have any questions coming in right now but I wonder have you like seen any polling I feel like I saw something maybe it was Hemet Meta who posted the other day some kind of polling about where people stand with these attacks on trans people and the LGBTQ community in general, because I think you said something in the beginning of your talk that these are not popular stances. Um, do you know what the numbers are, generally speaking, of Americans who don't see this as an issue? Yeah, so the numbers are pretty consistent, for better or for worse. Um, you know, there was a, a poll on the front page of the Washington Post this week that had some some pretty bad numbers that found that more people than not uh, just kind of don't believe that trans people are who we say we are. Um, but that 80% of people, and this is incredibly consistent, 80% of people support laws that would prevent discrimination against trans people in public schools, 80% um, support for laws that present that prevent discrimination against trans people in housing, employment, education, all those spheres. So, um, and the flip side about of that is that there's been consistent polling that has showed that um, with regard to schools, voters pretty universally regard guns as the, the thing that they're worried about affecting their children and rank kind of, you know, their children learning that LGBTQ people exist much, much lower on the list of their priorities, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, Mars is asking 80% why. I mean, I think that we have gotten to a place as a country where the idea of government sanctioned discrimination against any population, even if it's a population that you don't particularly agree with or understand or support, um, is just not politically popular. And so that's something um, where there's a far greater consensus than other issues. Um, okay, there's another question here from Connie. Connie is asking, um, can you provide any data on the actual number of trans people uh, and young people receiving related care? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's really important to put this all in perspective. So for example, there's been a raging debate about access to puberty blockers for trans people. The best numbers suggest that 5,000 people in the whole country are taking this medication. Um, it's vanishingly small, right? Um, there, was, there was actually a really incredible moment on Joe Rogan's podcast where Daily Wire personality Matt Walsh, who has kind of led the crusade against, I know, against trans people, um, asserted that he thought millions of children were taking puberty blockers, which is just not the case. And the, the flip side of that is that, um, you know, medications like puberty blockers are used for other reasons. So they're, um, a lot of times they're used to treat younger cancer patients for certain types of cancers, which is very important. They're also used pretty routinely to stop precocious puberty. So if you have a, a child who's experiencing puberty at 9, 10, 11, which happens all too commonly these days. Uh, these are the medications that are used to slow that down and wait for their development to catch up. Um, so, you know, the numbers are, are this, is a, this is a small population, right? The total percentage of people in the United States who say that they're transgender is 0.5%. 
um, there have been some really interesting polls. So there was a, a poll from YouGov that kind of asked people to estimate how common they thought certain populations were. And so they said in that poll, like the public said in that poll that they thought 20% of people were trans, which I think the gap between the actual number of trans people and that 20% number just really shows you like how skewed this whole conversation has gotten. Most Americans still say that they do not know a single trans person. And so that has made it really, really easy to villainize us. Mm -hmm. um, so there are kind of some similar questions here. Kirk is asking in the Q&A, can you give us numbers or percentages regarding trans people? Well, so we've covered that part, but now about trans ath athletes, you know, and I think it's an important thing, to, a, a distinction between K-12 trans athletes who are just little kids who want to play sports, right, and are, who are really not likely to take it to a professional level, and then maybe even what percentage of folks are in a, you know, collegiate setting or professional setting. Yeah, it's a really nuanced, complicated issue, and the discussion about it just is not nuanced or complicated. You know, there are, I think, a lot of priorities that advocates for women's sports agree um, are critical to address the huge disparities between men's and women's athletic um, competitions. So, you know, one thing is just disparity of coverage, right? A lot of these networks are only covering women's athletic activities when there's a trans woman competing, which makes it hard to believe that, that this is an issue that they really care about. There's pay disparities, there's disparities in coaching and facilities and all things that I personally think are really, really important to correct. In terms of the number of athletes who are involved, um, it's, you know, I don't have an estimate for the entire country, but it's, it's again, vanishingly small. So there was a recent Supreme Court decision, for example, where the state of West Virginia has banned transgender athletes. Um, and there was a trans girl who I want to say is in middle school on her cross country team. And so the state of West, West Virginia uh, filed a case that went all the way to su the Supreme Court asking that while the case is decided that they can exclude this one single trans girl from her middle school cross country team. Yeah, that's, uh, we had a law in the 2022 session that banned um, trans girls from playing sports in K-12 settings. And we have, we there already is an organization, the, I think, Arizona Interscholastic uh, Association. They have, um, you know, measures for, you know, they have requirements that, that trans athletes have to go through. Uh, and, and I think, there's maybe five in the whole state of yeah. Arizona or something, you know, but it's now become a lawsuit. There is a family in Tucson who is suing uh, over that law being discriminatory against their two trans daughters. They have, I believe, a middle school and a high school uh, daughter. So it'll be interesting to follow that case and see how it how it turns out. Um, I think. Go ahead. If I can just jump in real quick, I think a, a dynamic that we don't discuss enough in the context of sports is for especially K through 12, what an important part of the kind of community sports are. So for a lot of um, kids that age, like if they can't play youth softball, if they can't play youth soccer, how are they supposed to be a part of the community? It's, you know, I, I think that we are kind of losing the forest for the trees here and, and losing the fact that trans kids deserve normal childhoods where they're not meant to, when they're not made to feel um, like they're less than, like they're not allowed to participate more broadly. And that obviously it is important that everybody is safe. It is important that competition is fair, but those are not the only objectives, especially for sports for little kids. And the, the frustrating part about that is, you know, like I, I belong, my parents were softball coaches. I had no choice but to play softball and I enjoyed playing sports. Um, and, and it, it taught me so much, you know, it teaches, I, I've never went on to be a professional athlete or anything like that, but just the belonging and the camaraderie. My daughter did club volleyball. Um, 
her, her wedding was yesterday and one of her volleyball players actually did the makeup. I mean, like it's a bond that lasts. And so to take that away from a child seems so cruel. We can go ahead and, and talk about the outcomes, the negative outcomes for trans students and the fact that they are far more likely to have, you know, thoughts about suicide or self-harm. And so when they contort themselves and say, we're doing this to protect your trans child, I I just can't wrap my brain around that. I, I, it, it's so cruel and so obvious to me now at this point that the cruelty seems to be the point and the othering of trans people is just the beginning. Yeah, and, and that kind of rhetoric, um, you know, goes back 50 years. So there, there's an interview with Anita Bryant where she's campaigning um, to repeal a provision in Florida protecting LGBTQ people's equal rights. And um, in the in their interview, she says, I love I love LGBTQ people. I don't I don't know if she said LGBTQ, like whatever she said at the time, but but she was like, I am doing this out of love. I love them. And so I wish they would stop sinning. And I hear that all the time, right? It's something that uh, the kind of right-wing infrastructure has convinced itself that it's doing. Yeah, I <laughs> I see the, the comment from Annika and yes. Um, the, especially with their harassment campaign against Dylan Mulvaney, uh, they've adopted this kind of framework that, that what they're doing is being nice to trans people in the long term by telling us that we're deluded and that we will simply be happier if we abandon our delusions. And for what it's worth, um, most trans people try for years and years to find like another answer to what's going on with us besides I'm trans because like, I don't know, like, I don't know if y'all have noticed, but like, there's a lot of bullshit that comes with being trans and how you're treated in society. And so like, the idea that we could simply just stop and that things would be better. Like we, we've mostly tried that for years. Yeah. Um, okay, there's a bunch of questions. So I'm gonna try to sort through uh, one that came in through the chat. Uh, let's see who is this. This is Stephanie. She says, Ari, can you share additional ways that allies can stand against this horrible anti-trans path we are on? Most of us already vote for the safest candidate in any election we can. Boy, ain't that the truth. How can we could be good allies? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just important to... So many of these conversations are just because... Trans people are so rare. So many of the conversations about us are happening in rooms that we are not in um, through these kind of like whisper campaigns, through the, these attempts to make um, to make it seem like there's this consensus that trans people are not welcome. And I remember this from my childhood. I grew up in the 90s in rural upstate New York and like a major form of socializing was kind of just like jokes about gay people, about trans people, about the idea that, you know, there was something inherently hilarious about somebody being born male and then putting on a dress. Uh, so, you know, I think when you hear stuff like that, just being like, why is that funny? Um, you, like, you don't even have to say that's not funny. Just ask why it's funny, because a lot of times people can't justify that because the point isn't humor. The point is uh, to kind of create the social conformity that is enforced through things that are passed off as humor. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, Jackie wants to know, how do you feel when people want to take the issue away from being trans, trans specific and make it more relevant to people by gearing the conversation back to patient privacy? I think that's a really good idea. Um, the mainstream media, too much of the mainstream media has convinced itself that trans people and specifically trans young people do not deserve patient privacy. So I remember I got into this kind of back and forth with New York Magazine columnist Jonathan Chait, who had published this account from a Missouri gender clinic where a kind of disgruntled whistleblower was claiming that children were coming in and saying like, I identify as an attack helicopter and, and were immediately given hormones, which it should be said that a review by the hospital has shown was not the case, categorically untrue. But when I raised the patient privacy point in that context, like 
these are children, right? Mm -hmm. um, this columnist was like, well, like the same argument was used against reporting on President Trump. And I think we just need to step back and remember that people's patient, people's private medical history is not the same as the scrutiny that should be given to the president of the United States and um, just kind of try to regain some perspective there. Yeah, um, let's see, there is another question. I think this one's also from Jackie. What is the harm with separating transitions between social transition and medical transition when talking about trans youth? I'm assuming she means, you know, when you're trying to make an argument with somebody. Yeah, I mean, that's a really tough, that's a really tough place to be. I, I, a problem with separating social and medical transition, which I, I tried um, when, when I transitioned, I actually socially transitioned first before I started medically transitioning in part because I know that this is like a very serious life-changing path to go down. And I wanted to make sure that I could not address it um, non-medically before I was able to address it medically. And it is very hard to separate somebody's own experience of the world from the way in which society treats us. And society does not treat people who are visibly gender non-conforming very well at all. So that's one part of it is that just from a safety perspective, it is it remains to be it remains safer for trans people to medically transition. And there's a whole conversation to be had about that, about making the world safer for gender non-conforming people. But generally, like when somebody's house is on fire, you put out the fire first. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, and I think this is underplayed because people tend to focus on the physical aspect of um, hormone therapy, but hormone therapy for trans people has a really positive effect in terms of reversing depersonalization, reversing dissociation, reducing anxiety, and reducing depression. So studies have found that trans people who are able to receive gender-affirming care, um, in this case, hormone therapy, experienced greater decreases in depression than they would if they were treated with SSRIs or comparable medication. Um, so, a lot of the aspects of medical transition really are meant to address that kind of inner turmoil, the depression, the anxiety. You know, I remember, um, I don't remember how long into my medical transition, but I just have, I remember this moment where I was on a hike in a state park in my, my hometown. And I just kept being kind of distracted by like the realization that I have hands and um, had this moment where it was like, I have had the feeling my entire life that I am floating somewhere above my body, observing myself in the third person. And suddenly it's like the, my point of view, like locked into my own self. And I felt like I was a person just like living, um, in my body. And that's, that's really trippy to hear about. Right. But it's, there's just something about the experience of gender dysphoria that just makes your mind want to flee your body in a way that is really, really uncomfortable. Mm, yeah. Um, there's so many questions. I'm going to try to, um, I'm trying to, okay, Matt has been up here for a while. First of all, Annika says I'm trans and I appreciate you all doing this. Um, Matt says, <laughs> uh, with support for laws protecting equality consistently polling so high, why are politicians supporting and spreading this bigotry? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's interesting. I think that there are several components to it. So this has become such a hot button issue that I think Republican primary voters kind of want, they want to see this, right? They want to see politicians taking stands on this. So it's kind of, it's yet another political problem that has become a factor of kind of the, it's it's a problem created by um, the way that our partisan primaries work. So just like gun safety, just like mm -hmm. climate change, just like any other kind of issue where there's polarization, um, Republican candidates choose their voters often more than more than 
voters get to choose their candidates. And so they're in these primaries where they have to appeal to the most extreme people. Um, and then they get locked into those approaches going into the general election. So um, that's why I think you'll continue to hear a ton about it throughout the Republican primary, even if like normal mainstream general election voters want to hear about the economy. They want to hear about inflation. They want to hear about the cost of living. And, you know, they're not particularly concerned that um, somebody is going to trans their children. Yeah. Um, okay. Let me go back to the chat here because there is a question here. Okay. The conservative, this is a long one. This one is from RJ. The conservative movement to not only intrude on parental and medical authority slash guidance, but to criminalize the actions of loving parents and the medical guidance and support they need only diminishes base support. Tennessee refused federal funding for HIV patients as an anti-trans LGBT act. Thankfully, the United Way stepped up. Who are the national allies willing to sue these states and actively seek federal protections for LGBTQ2S people. They divide us by attacking non-white, non-straight identifying people. I want to believe that the majority of Americans are still mostly concerned with safety and economic stability. So, I mean, yeah. you, can, you kind of covered that one a little bit, I think. Well, there's but this, there is this um, degree to which I think so much of this conversation is happening right now because the Republican party would rather have you debating you know, if a man can get pregnant, uh, which like literally does not affect anybody who is not a trans dude. Um, they want you to have that debate because they don't want you to talk about how they are criminalizing abortion, right? Like it's 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 an effort at a distraction. I think it's, um, you know, I don't want to suggest that this isn't stuff that they believe. And, you know, I think a lot of their beliefs there are shaped by a kind of sense of religious convictions and the feeling that the person who you are is determined not by you, not by society, but by God, and that that is not changeable. Um, but I think the extent to which this has become part of the popular conversation now, it's because they have this other way more important issue that they are losing on, and they would like to change the subject to something that they regard as more divisive. Mm hmm yeah, it's so offensive. I've there's a few senators here in Arizona state senators who they love to ask the lobbyists or the, you know, the people who come and speak at committee hearings, you know, what is a woman and it's yeah. It's just so incredibly offensive. Um let's see. This is a good comment here. Stephanie says the seeds of anti-trans and anti-gay tropes come from toxic masculinity and anti-femme sexism I, and i'll add purity culture to that too i think is is a culprit there um and, and for them to also like say we're the ones that are protecting women y'all have never wanted to protect women <laughs> yeah um, I, I hear a lot i you know i am way too active on twitter and i get a lot of very hateful comments there um but i i hear a lot of like you know, people who, who say that they're speaking up against me on behalf of lesbians. And, you know, lesbians are possibly the most supportive of trans people of any community in the country. And typically the people who are kind of claiming that what they're doing is to protect lesbians, JK Rowling does this a lot, for example. She's a, you know, she is a straight identified woman, right? Like she is speaking for a community that is not her own because she thinks that it's a stronger rhetorical attack. And there's just a lot of that happening. Um, I'm seeing two similar questions. There's one in the chat and then one um, from anonymous attendee. Uh, so the one in the chat is from Chris. How do you address the lack of support for trans surgeries for minors? They are the most vulnerable of the population. I think that uh, the conversation of, around trans people really heavily focuses on surgeries, uh, especially coming from people who are not trans. So much of transitioning has so little to do with surgery. Um, it's a very kind of personal subject, but 
you know, the idea that children are being rushed into the operating room and op and performed on, uh, this it's just not happening. And, you know, the if you look at statistics around things like top surgery, um, you know, um, breast removal for trans men, transgender men, or um, sometimes but not always breast implants for trans women, um, the rates of cisgender children who are going through, um, you know, cis boys are operated on all the time for breast tissue if that develops during puberty. Um, cisgender girls are allowed to get breast implants with parental consent under the age of 18 throughout the country, and higher numbers of people are doing that than trans people. Um, I think that there's certainly an appropriate conversation to be had about uh, surgery on minors and the profit motives in our medical system and how that skews everything. But I, it's hard to believe that this conversation is being held in good faith when it is only applied to trans people. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I loved that came out of Wyoming, um, because, and I believe it had to do with Obamacare and, you know, freedoms and, you know, you can't tell people in Wyoming, they wrote something into their constitution about like, you know, right to privacy and medical care. And so they basically stopped themselves as a state from being able to implement an abortion ban. And I'm assuming it also means that trans folks can still get the medical care that they need. I hope so anyway. Um, let's see, this one's from RJ again. This is more of a comment. Criminalizing LGBTQ folks is a diversion. They have no solutions to the issues that matter. So they attack LGBTQ, BIPOC, women, immigrants. It's exhausting. It sure is exhausting, RJ. It is absolutely exhausting. Um, uh, Farrell is asking, can you say more about gender dysphoria? What about, what about gender dysphoria? Do you want to hear more about yeah, if you want to clarify that, uh, Farrell, and let us know what you mean by that, we can get back to you. Uh, Matt is saying makes a lot of sense, and I've not looked at that. Okay, I'm not sure what he's referencing there. Here's another one from Mark. I recently finished Jesus and John Wayne. I find their attitude toward gender roles rather disgusting. How, as people promoting separation of church and state, do we counter their arguments? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I think experiencing this whole backlash as a trans person, I think has made me very skeptical of the use of state power to kind of enforce conformity. Um, this is a really big country. There's what, 340 million people living in it. And there are so many different communities that have different views, different lifestyles. Um, we cannot use the government to enforce those views on everybody. And I think that so much of what's happening now is the Christian right is watching the number of people who say that they do not have a religious identification become the kind of majority or the, the plurality at this moment for the very first time in American history. And so a lot of these efforts, the effort to criminalize abortion, the effort to criminalize gender affirming care, a lot of the kind of backlash we're, we're seeing right now against women speaking out against sexual assault, sexual violence, all of that is an attempt to kind of seize power before they lose it and, um, you know, put this theocracy into effect before they have no chance of succeeding at that. Mm -hmm. um, all right, let's see, there's more questions. Let's see, let's see. Okay, uh, Jude says politicians depend on voter turnout. This issue drives voter turnout of those who support anti-LGBT stances. The solution, get slash stay involved in local voter registration and GOTV efforts. Absolutely. Um, Annika is saying, Kristen Browd, I hope I'm saying that name right, Kristen Browd on TikTok and other platforms. She's trans and an attorney and does regular pot. Oh, I think I know who you're talking about. And uh, uh, attorney and does regular podcasts breaking down newly indicted child molesters, et cetera. And the largest demographic in that group is Christian clergy. Yep. Um, grooming is so often said to be sexualizing kids and too often it feels like the Christian leadership who actually sexualize, sexualizes kids gets to define the narrative. I've said it before and I will say it again. Every accusation is a confession. 
That's it. And there's some other really great, I mean, I'm more on Twitter than TikTok, I, but I do know who you're referencing and she's great. Um, but there's Bex as, as a user on Twitter who, who constantly every day, if you can stomach it, uh, you know, posts yet another story of, of people, not necessarily always Christian leaders, but people in positions of power who use that power to abuse children, whether it is clergy or police officers or other public servants, teachers, um, coaches, troop leaders, and of course, Republicans, because nine times out of 10, right? Like, you know, the, the folks who are saying, oh, you know, we've got to ban drag shows. They're the ones that are, you know, getting in trouble for, you know, um, raping their interns or whatever. So every accusation is a con confession. Do you want to comment at all on that? The fact that it does seem to be um, leadership within religious institutions or other areas where this seems to be happening? I mean, I mean, I think it all comes out of this purity culture that that like kind of creates very strange attitudes around children and childhood and, you know, sees uh, the realization by a child that they might be gay or trans as something that is worse than violence literally inflicted on their body, especially in the case of, I think, school shootings. Um, the idea that, you know, it, it would be better for somebody to uh, be sent to heaven while they're in this pure state of childlike innocence than it would for them to uh, have some kind of epiphany about their own identity. It's very strange to me. I think it's not something that's well understood um, in the conversation around gun violence and, and the sexualization of children. Um, but I think it's a really important dynamic to understand for all of this, which is that um, for so many of the anti-LGBTQ people, uh, LGBTQ identity is a fall from God's grace and um, not something to be celebrated, but kind of represents the end of, of somebody's life in the church. And, um, you know, I think that that shapes a lot of the conversations about this in ways that are really troubling. Um, all right, let's move on here. I can see a conversation happening in there that I just am not in the mood to entertain right now. Um, and I appreciate all of those of you who are entertaining <laughs> that conversation, but I just am not going to do it. Um, because I will say, I, I do feel a need to say that I think if you're going on about the mutilation of bodies, you probably just don't understand what's happening at all. And I think it would be worth listening to trans people about why somebody might undergo something as dramatic as surgery, which it's scary as shit, right? Like nobody's like, oh my God, I'm so excited to go have a major surgery on my body. It's it's something that is very personal and kind of a kind of last resort for people. And surgery, surgery is messy. Surgery is dangerous. All surgeries come with risks and potential complications, risk of regret, uh, you know, the, uh, the risk that somebody might regret a knee replacement surgery, for example, is 30%, the same, almost the same for the risk that somebody might regret an elective rhinoplasty. So, um, you know, once again, I think any conversation around surgical intervention shouldn't focus only on trans people because that just shows you don't understand the experience. And that's fine. You don't have to understand the experience. I, I wish I didn't, um, for sure. I, I think, uh, but there are much broader conversations to be had that are not just scapegoating a tiny, tiny community. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think it's really important. I was incredibly lucky. My um, stepdaughter, um, 10 or so years ago, uh, started dating a trans boy. And um, that, that young man was so gracious in, a, in helping us understand. And I'm sure we said things that were offensive, you know, or, or asked questions that were none of our damn business. But the fact that, that he was so willing to sit with us, Gen X old fogies, right. And like, just talk about his experience. It, it helped immensely, you know, um, my, you know, when I go to the Capitol and we're, you know, testifying against these bad bills, I've gotten to meet so many 
beautiful trans children and their families and their families, their parents love them more than anything else in the world. They move from other states. You know, I have friends that have moved from Texas because they saw the writing on the wall, you know, like, so yeah. just get to know somebody, ask some questions and, and open up your eyes or, and your mind so you can understand, you know, I, I don't agree with people having plastic surgery. It's not something that I would want to do. I don't want, and I don't want larger breasts. I don't want, you know, implants in my butt, but I'm not going to judge anybody who gets it. If that is what you want, then you go ahead and do that. If you lost a bunch of weight and want to get rid of some extra skin, go ahead and do that. And like you said, those are dangerous surgeries and, and people think about them before they go under and go under the scalpel. So let's move on to some questions here. Let's see. Um, Farrell says, I'd like, to, and I hope I'm saying your name right. I'd like to, oh, I think this is the one about body dysmorphia um, or gender dysmorphia, I mean. I'd like to understand more about what this experience is. Obviously, it's going to be different for everyone, but it seems to me that understanding what it feels like to be in the wrong body has to be part of the conversation. And again, that is what Eli helped me understand 10 years ago, is that mm -hmm. those conversations of what it felt like for him every day waking up and feeling like he was in the wrong body. So do you want to speak to that personally? Sure. I, I mean... I think the wrong body framework uh, was something adopted by trans people many, many years ago, just trying to make our experiences legible to people who, who haven't had them. Um, and I think has become a little, you know, it's become this thing that's argued over and scapegoated, right? Like the idea, no one's born in the wrong body. And that's true, I think. Um, I never felt like I was born in the wrong body, but I did feel like the way that my body had developed was incredibly uncomfortable to me. Um, so I think so much of the experience of dysphoria, which I should also say is a distinct experience from body dysmorphia. So dysmorphia, just um, for the for the for the audience, dysmorphia is kind of an unrealistic image of your body. Usually, it's size, so people will be convinced that they're much heavier than they are or much thinner than they are, or that their chest is much smaller than it is, or that is much larger than it is. All Those are all experiences of dysmorphia, which is um, kind of a, an inability to see your own body accurately. Dysphoria is kind of its inverse, which is um, the fact that you see your body quite clearly and something about it is very uncomfortable to your brain. Um, it's not really well understood why this happens, but it is something that has been noted throughout history. Uh, you know, there are historical figures going all the way back to, you know, there's a Roman emperor who was what we would say in contemporary times was transgender. Um, it's a really wild case that is worth looking into if you have time and are curious. Uh, you know, in the 1950s, uh, Christine Jorgensen was a trans woman who had been a former World War II soldier and um, was the first public, publicly, the first person in the U.S. to publicly disclose having had what was then called a sex change operation, um, which is a much more fun thing to say than, than what we say now, but also not particularly accurate. So all of this is kind of just really complicated, but I think the way to make it understandable to, to other people is that, you know, everybody takes steps to affirm their gender. Everybody takes steps to make their body more comfortable to them. You know, something I really like about my body is that I'm very physically fit at this point. And the reason that I like that is because the activities that I love, hiking, skiing, are things that are enabled by having a body that is physically strong. And also because um, a year ago, I had a very bad case of pneumonia and I, my, I had a collapsed lung and I had to spend a week in the hospital and then was kind of uh, not able to do those activities for quite a while. So it's kind of a, I see the idea out there all the time that trans people just need to learn to love our bodies, but there, there just is a difference between um, the dysphoria that I was talking about earlier that makes you want to flee your own body, that creates this sense of depersonalization, 
dissociation that, that's just really physically painful and mentally painful and um, kind of the cosmetic stuff in there. Um, I, I really, you know, when I had, was first transitioning, I remember I, I talked to this, this trans guy who'd been out probably a decade and he said the thing that I think about all the time, which is um, he was like, you know, I have these moments where I'm just like, this is crazy. Like this looks crazy to other people. I understand why people think that this is weird, but I am so much happier and I care about what my future looks like now. And I think that's what matters, right? Like there are a lot of things in the world that we just don't fully understand yet that are, that are mysteries to us. And I think that's what makes the world beautiful, right? It's like, we don't really understand why people are the way they are, but everybody is so different. And I think that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Completely. All right. Um, we are at 12.55. So let's see, I've got a question and I think Kurt is, or Kirk. So in the, in the Q and A, he says, I've seen in print the claim that transsexualism is a fad among school-aged children. Can you comment on this? And then he clarifies, I believe he's referring to this. And he said, just to clarify my question, I think it's a preposterous claim. I am just curious to hear Ari's take on these types of claims. Yeah. Um, so a lot of times I will see people in the right-wing media who uh, take statistics about increases in trans identity and use that to make it sound really scary. So they'll talk about this one gender clinic in the United Kingdom where there was allegedly a 3,400% increase in trans patients in the last decade. Um, I've looked at the numbers and that, that increase is from like, what is it? I, it's it's a very small number to another very small number, but because the first number was so small, the second number seems statistically much larger when, you know, in reality, it's like far, far less than like 1% of the children in England at, at this time. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of what we're seeing, well, we're seeing a couple things, right? We're seeing the impact of the internet on the way that people's identities are formed um, and that people kind of understand, people are kind of less like fixated on the kind of um, reproductive like means of their body, whatever. But I think more of what we're seeing is just that historically being trans has been a really not great experience where you're treated very poorly. So, you know, something that kept me from coming out when I was a young person is that the only portrayals that I saw of trans adults were on Jerry Springer, um, where they were inevitably, you know, you'd see someone who um, they'd bring on their ex and be like, your, your, your ex lied to you. Like, she's really a man. And then the like ex-husband would get like very upset, um, which also like, there's just no way they didn't know, right? Like they're just performing that for the cameras. But, and then the other place that I saw a trans woman as a child was, por was pornography. Like that was the only place where we were. And so, you know, there are certain, I think there are lots of people, including me, who in an early earlier era would not have come out as trans because the life that you would have had that you would have been forced into having come out was just very marginal, very, very difficult. And, you know, the trans community still faces a lot of discrimination. So the unemployment rate for trans people is double the average unemployment rate. The underemployment rate for trans people is like 42%. It's really, really bad. But uh, we are having more footholds, in, you know, in different employment spheres and you know, while it seems like things are really publicly bad right now, I think the number of people who kind of privately are tolerant, at least of, of the existence of trans people has gone up quite a bit. So I, th I think that the increase that we're seeing is more kind of a, a natural increase. Um, I like to, I, I know I've talked a long time on this one, but um, I like to compare it to the rise in left-handedness, as you might've seen, if you see me on Twitter, um, at a certain point towards the start of the century, uh, something like 2% of people uh, said that they were left-handed in surveys. 
And then after a brief time, the number skyrocketed to 14%. So if you've been looking at that phenomenon during the middle of it, you would have been like, something is in the water. What is happening? But what actually happened was just teachers stopped abusing children for being left-handed. Uh, my, my, I actually, I asked my grandparents about this. And my grandma said that, um, so my, my great grandfather's left-handed, my grandfather's left-handed. And I was like, how did they, you know, how did they get through? And apparently my grand, my great grandfather who had dropped out of school at like an early age. So he hadn't really dealt with this came into the school and had to threaten the teachers to let his son write with his left hand. Um, this was a pretty broad societal phenomenon. Anytime I've tweeted about this, I've gotten dozens of people who are like, oh, this happened to me. They would hit me with a ruler if I wrote with my left hand. They would tie my left hand behind my back. Um, so a lot of this is just that our society really used to enforce conformity. conformity. And um, over time, that has kind of lifted a little from allowing people to be left-handed, allowing people to be gay, um, and allowing people to be trans. And so I think you've seen a similar phenomenon in all in all of those spheres. And I think that the rate of increase of people saying that they're, they're trans will level off eventually uh, as it kind of gets closer to its natural rate. Well, yeah. And I mean, I think too, just the, you know, wild success of shows like RuPaul's Drag Race or, you know, we're here on HBO Max. And if you haven't seen it, just have a box of tissue next to you because these drag queens go to small towns in the United States and, you know, people write to them and say, I'm trans or I'm gay or I'm closeted or, you know, I was not kind to my daughter and I want to show support to her or whatever. You know what I mean? A uh, yeah. really good show. But like when you see yourself reflected in media, you know, and it's part of the reason too, right? Right. While we're seeing book bannings. They don't want pe trans people or people of color or, you know, uh, they don't want people to see themselves. Yeah. Um, they want them to fit into this very narrow definition of what men and women are and of what, how people should behave and whatever. Um, okay, this is the last one because it is 102 and I appreciate you and I want to honor your time. Um, Anika, uh, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right. She says, you're so pretty. Who did your facial feminization, if you don't mind sharing? <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, yeah, I. Sorry, that one caught me off guard. I'm um, sorry. <laughs> no, it's OK. I I mean, again, the the way we talk about trans people receiving surgery is so um, kind of hostile that uh, I, I tend to be somewhat private about it. Um, yeah. but at the same time, um, facial feminization surgery, which is, um, a less discussed trans surgery, but the, the way that it works is to, um, remove the ways in which basically your skull is masculinized by testosterone during puberty. Um, so that's uh, basically shaving down your brow bone to make your eyes appear more open, um, other kind of changes like that. Well, so, and she says too in the chat, private is okay. You don't have to share. Oh, if you don't want no, to, it's, so. a, it's okay. I'm, I'm in the spiel. I'm talking about, we're talking about it because I um, think that this is a life, this was a life-changing surgery for me. I had it in um, December of, God, what year is it? I had it in December of 2021. Um, and I feel like that was the single biggest kind of inflection point in my whole life. Like I, I had been so scared uh, to just be myself in public um, because I would get kind of hostile glares or, or comments. Um, and that all went away. Uh, and also just kind of like, you know, it felt like there was some kind of static in my mind that just cleared, right? Where it's like, I could I could look in a mirror and not um, see the person that I had been forced to be by society and see how my life would have gone uh, had I been allowed to be myself at a, at a younger age. Um, so all of that is to say, uh, the surgery was done by Dr. Cooperstock in Virginia, who I think is excellent. He's very conservative um, in his approach, uh, would, 
which I think, you know, I think changes to your face are a very, very delicate thing that is a very strange experience in your brain and, and should not be pursued lightly. But I do think that this is the kind of thing that should be available to all trans people because um, the ability to exist comfortably in public is something that is so easy to take for granted until it's denied to you. Mm -hmm. Well, and then also, and I don't, you know, so it makes me think of now these bans in some of these states, Tennessee, Florida, you know, the, the harm that it's going to have on those kids who are already receiving those. And I've seen some really yeah. heart-wrenching TikTok videos of, you know, I'm, the one that I remember the most is a college student. I want to say they're in Tennessee, wherever there's one of those horrible bands. They had received a scholarship um, to go to school in whatever state it was that they're in. And they were just delivering this heart-wrenching, just emotional moment of like, what do I do now? What do I do? Do I turn down this scholarship? Yeah. Like that's how, that's how bad it would feel for that person to, you know, have to give up the access to their medical care. I yeah. just, anyway, and, and yeah, go ahead. Conservatives do seem to understand that, um, you know, a kind of feature of the debate about trans healthcare has been people who have publicly detransitioned uh, and kind of disavowed the whole thing. And, you know, the right-wing media will have these people on and be like, look at how fucked up they are now. Like we need to, and then, and this is what they're doing to literal children in multiple states who have already been receiving medical care. Um, and there's no carve-outs in these bills to allow them to continue. They're, they either have to leave the state or detransition. And like, you know, if anyone on this call who's who's gone through menopause or who's had other reasons that, yeah, like your if your hormones in your body change dramatically, that's very unpleasant. Um, I you know I had to go off. I was I had to go off hormones before I had that surgery, which um, was very 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 unpleasant and really really messed with me for a few weeks. Um, I can't imagine having that done to you permanently, especially if again, you've kind of seen how this helps you and, and the reductions in anxiety and depression that come along with it. I can't imagine how much worse those would come back if they're being forced on you by the state. Mm, yeah. Well, okay. Again, it's 107 now. I'm super yeah. sorry for going over, but I will say the vast majority of the comments here have been nothing but positive. Um, they've been genuinely curious and uh, mostly very supportive. So um, I want to say thank you That's so all much. That's you can hope for. <laughs> right. Um, and, and so if you don't mind, because this is a heavy topic to yeah. tackle on a Friday afternoon, yeah. what are the things that give you hope? The things that give me hope. I mean, I think conversations like this, uh, I... Okay, this is very silly, but I am really, really bad at doing paperwork. And so it took me like years after transitioning to kind of change my my driver's license. And so, you know, anytime that I check into a hotel or uh, or went to buy alcohol, which I, I don't really drink, but, um, you know, like, or go into a bar and I would have to show somebody my ID it's almost a little fun, right? Like there was, there would be this like, oh, um, but nobody was mean about it. Like nobody was a jerk about it the whole time. Um, I think that there is such a difference between the way that people talk about this issue in their, in their own lives when they know a trans person and um, the ways in which this gets discussed online or in the media. Uh, I think that it's it's just a very complicated, nuanced, personal subject. And, you know, when I came out, um, my family was not fantastic about it. Uh, my partner's family was not fantastic about it. And, you know, that was really, really hard at the beginning, but we're all in a much, much better place now because like we were able to work through it. Um, you know, I think there's this meme out there that trans people are very kind of like angry and judgmental and, um, eager to pounce on you if you say the wrong thing. And that's, I, you know, again, I think that's just not what things are like in the real world, because frankly, like if we acted like that, life would be miserable. Um, like we all, 
understand the the journeys that people go on around around these issues. Um, I think if you're somebody who wants to learn more about this uh, and you know has questions that I haven't been able to answer, the book Whipping Girl by Julia Serrano gets into the um, God, sorry, it's Friday afternoon and I'm, I'm short on words, but it, it gets into the way that uh, misogyny and anti-transness kind of overlap and, and build on, another, on each other and how that affects the way that, that, um, that people see trans people and, and actually specifically trans women, though there's a different conversation to be had about the way that people um, see trans men. I, I, before we wrap, I, I really appreciate everybody joining for this. I'm really grateful for all the questions. I was worried that I would kind of like give my little talk and then it would be crickets. But I also think that this is a much more interesting way to have a conversation um, because you know what you're interested in. And so I really, really appreciate everybody participating in the conversation. Yeah, it's I, I've, I, it was hard for me to keep up with the questions and that is not <laughs> always the case when yeah. we have speakers. So Thank you so, so much. I love your Twitter. Uh, uh, somebody else commented, thank you for all your tweets. Oh, um, God. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, it seems to be, we all enjoy them. So um, again, thank you so much. I hope you all have a really wonderful weekend. Thanks, Ari. You too. Bye, everybody.